Arnie, your thoughts on if 30% growth is sustainable? Look, uh, we started the beginning of the year thinking, oh, we wish uh, we get uh, again to 30%. And boom, like <laughs> if we exclude the impact of a SPAC, which uh, contributed negatively to the year on year growth, because uh, SPACs, rather than expanding, they just declined in. Uh, in earnings actually have been cutting out. The growth rate was not 27%, but the organic growth was 30%. Now that to me is the big hint, the big strong signal that personally I was not expecting. Like I wished it would have happened. And uh, personally I was expecting it to be more toward the end of the year. So essentially it's like we are cutting timelines and uh, the reason why is exactly the slide that you shared previously, which is so significant because it tells us that not only Palantir is getting clients, but is getting clients that are really well willing to spend a lot in relatively little time. It's like Palantir right now has uh, two velocities, two, two speeds. One with like the legacy customers, which are tend to be like big, uh, but relatively slow. And the new set of customers that are big, but they're willing to spend a lot because uh, the deals over $10 million, 27 deals closed in the quarter. It's like two X what we had uh, last year. So the go-to-market motion is truly getting there. The, 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 the clients are eager to spend. And there were like a, a couple of comments uh, in the earnings call that uh, stuck to me. Like uh, Sham uh, described the two examples of a uh, hospital and a manufacturer, but the, the, the archetype was like uh, one year, well, a couple of uh, million revenues. Second year is more about $5 million revenues, which for software, enterprise software in a year, that's already a very big, uh, big check. And then you know what? Third year, bam, $20 million deal. So a uh, year yearly. So $20 million deal is like uh, 4X, the average uh, um, revenue per customer. So they are getting deals that are set to increase uh, this, uh, this average as uh, Emir underscored. But the net dollar retention has finally, I would say finally, started to trend upwards after a decline up to, but that reached 107%. Now we are at 114%, meaning that the existing customers as of last year are expanding 14%. And these include like the biggest customers, the top 20 customers and so on. But as the CFO finally underscored a little bit better, this metric understates the real impact of the growth because the new customers that have been acquired in the last 12 months, so the new customers are the one actually driving the growth. And from this chart, we can see that this 27% growth that we got comes from around 14% from the new client, from the existing customers. But the new customers, so only the ones acquired in these last years, in this last year, contributed for 13% of that growth. So essentially how Palantir in keeps increasing growth is by expanding more of the existing customers and by getting more new clients that are heavily spending. So this dynamic is what uh, tells us, okay, Palantir has finally shifted uh, gear and uh, we are really ready to rock. Coach Rep says, in my opinion, growth will continue to accelerate into next year, driven in large part by AI success stories and growing partner and developer ecosystem 2025 is the inflection point. Arnie, uh, how do you value Rocketship? And do you think 2025 is the NVIDIA type of quarter that we're waiting for? Isn't it interesting that uh, this 2025 is like the sort of uh, year, flagship year that already two, three years ago, we were thinking, oh, 2025 will be the year. And by the time we are approaching to this 2025, it seems like, oh shit, like Carp saw that. <laughs> Well, even so, Carp, remember, uh, in 2022, in August, he said we won't be profitable till 2025. Exactly. So uh, all the expectations toward this 2025 being the year where we see 
the racket uh, actually really taking off? And uh, in order to answer how do you value a rocket ship, we first need to understand the ontology <laughs> of uh, a rocket ship. So there was a, a very nice comment uh, from uh, Jim3482 who said, rocket ships are valued at the cost of operation and the future demand for payload delivery along with competition consideration. If we translate this concept to Palantir, we need to think, oh, how much is worth all the tech they developed in the last uh, 20 years, if we assume they not wasted time, <laughs> but uh, they deployed this time to actually build the software that matters. So we have uh, 20 years of use cases, not general use cases, but the most complicated use cases in the world, being that pandemic, war, war developing uh, efficiency into Airbus, which has one of the most complex uh, supply chains in the world. And there's a second dynamic that is more or less closer to what Garcia was thinking if, uh, oh, but uh, what's the speed uh, towards uh, uh, toward the object, so toward the goal? But also there, I was thinking, uh, yes, but that's what you can really calculate uh, easily when uh, you know that the speed is kind of fixed. But if I think of a rocket in the initial stages, and uh, Matt here can correct me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> the rocket starts from still. Initially, it takes a long time to accelerate. You have the, all that phase where it's like, it goes up, but the acceleration, like the speed is not constant. Like the speed needs to accelerate until you reach, uh, I think what is called escape velocity, after which you really see the, the rocket taking off. So going back to the question is, okay, at what phase uh, of this rocket are we? I, I think we are still in the early stages of the acceleration, despite for us that we are here and we saw like the bottom of the, the growth, uh, this is already like, oh, that's 2x the revenue, the revenue growth. Like it must be like yeah. already escape velocity, but if I think in terms of potential, it's like uh, we are really scratching the surface. So I would, no. despite, I would love uh, and I hope uh, and I would not anchor myself to these expectations, but it's like, it is possible that we could see some absurd numbers in these uh, coming quarters uh, or like 2025, uh, the famous 2025, maybe we could even see something like crazy. 50% revenue growth in 2025 if all Maybe. the customers acquired in these last years have a sort of direction as we mentioned previously. One year, one, two million, second year, five million, third year, 20 million, bam. So how do you evaluate a rocket? And I think another way to think about that, Arnie, is like because our margins are so good, it doesn't take a lot of revenue to really add to the bottom line of the organization. And yep. so we've gotten to that place now where we we really have been paying for the SG&A costs. We were now gap profitable. So literally every dollar that we add in terms of revenue, 50 cents or 40 cents is going to the bottom line. So if you think we add, let's just say double the revenue from here, it's not like we're only going to be at, you know, 500 million net income. No, we're if we if we double the revenue from here from 2.75 to 6 billion, we're quadrupling the net income. Because we've already paid for that SGNA, right? We're already paying for that underlying operating costs. Now, every dollar that you're adding, as you've alluded to, the operating cost doesn't really move all that much, right? Um, and it hasn't for the many quarters. And so, because of that, you know, because our operating margins are so high, you're really just having to overcome the cost of goods sold, or I guess the cost of employees at that point, to really to really get to where you need to go. And so, for me. I think that this is the point where even if you're seeing a 30% or 40% growth, you have to think it's way different than seeing a lot of other companies because they don't have nearly the margin that we do. Um, mm -hmm. So a, another company might need to have 40 or 50% growth or 60% growth to even scratch where Palantir is kind of getting because we have such superior margins. Um, so anyway, just, just just wanted to add that in there as well, right? So yeah, if you think about it, if we're at $10 billion in revenue, we're making four to five billion dollars in operating income. Like 
that's huge. You add a 25 X multiple or 30 X multiple onto that. You're in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And you have to think we're, we're not too far away from that. Yeah. And, I think and like Arnie was saying too, is when you're zoomed in too much, like let's say if you're standing so close to the rocket, as soon as the rocket goes up a hundred feet for you, you're looking up and you're like, Oh my God, look how high that rocket is. I'm going to sell everything. And I'm just going to go look for the next opportunity. I think that's very short-sighted. You know, take a couple steps back and think, where is this rocket going in five years, 10 years? Are they going to stick around? Are they just a flash in the pan like C3 AI and these other companies that are trying to just take advantage of AI for the sake of AI? I mean, I think people really do need to take a step back. You know, traders will trade, but if you're investing, then you need to think like an investor and really take a couple steps back and see that, yes, this rocket has gone from zero feet to 100 feet. But man, this is going to be going to a thousand feet, miles up in the in the sky. So that's the way I'm looking at it, and I think uh, people should kind of take a longer term look. Have you seen uh, the picture from Elon Musk showing how them the the motors of the rockets uh, evolve? <laughs> Do you think we have uh, the la latest model of uh, the version the three Raptor? The engine? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a lean machine. <laughs> it looks like, it looks like it's, a it's wild, bro. It's wild. Can you imagine? I hope yeah. Archimedes looks like that in, in like a couple of years. I mean, that's our AAP. So the the sure. the closer we get to the to the moon, the leaner, the clearer, the better <laughs> our engine is. Yeah, and I think one more thing to add uh, to the valuation conversation is that the government's not going anywhere. The government's only expanding. NATO's a hundred billion dollar market that we have like barely tapped into. In fact, it was Codestrap on this channel two years ago who, th who thought after Russia invaded Ukraine that NATO is going to be a multi-hundred billion dollar market because they're going to need something to defend themselves, like Gotham. Uh, and obviously, if the United States government starts spending even one or 2% more on AI, that's tens of billions of dollars likely coming into the industry and then a certain percentage is that going to pound here. So that, I think, helps the government question. Government growth reaccelerated. We went from 12% to 24%, 6% to 12% for US. Like, we are really starting to see momentum in the government. And if that starts kegging at 30%, then it gets uh, as exciting as commercial. I think we haven't uh, so far really given merits to the government side because uh, <laughs> we were stuck to think, oh, the government side is the ma mature stuff, 10% uh, growth. Well, not the best, but that's what we get. And then boom, plus 20% uh, uh, or slightly more on the government side. Uh, is a strong signal that uh, the US government is spending heavily. And not only because if you look at the math, also government international expanded more or less uh, 20% because the overall growth was 20%, uh, US government was 20%. So by definition, also the international side was more or less into that uh, bulk part. Now, yeah. let's, let me share a couple of thoughts into the self-pleasuring moments uh, with uh, numbers because uh, we have discussed a lot into the expectations toward the future, the potential stages of a rocket. And uh, I like to always uh, have a sense, that's the best that we can have, uh, into, okay, what is the current price currently incorporating? And can you, can you we, zoom in? Uh, uh, you... Yes, sure. So if we go this way. Yeah. Okay, so if uh, we reverse uh, DCF, uh, essentially the valuation we get, we see what the market is currently implying uh, with uh, these uh, numbers. And to obtain a valuation of around uh, 30, we need to have uh, like uh, to more than 21% uh, growth diluted. I mean, this is a growth uh, at the net of uh, the dilution, which so it could be like 26% uh, growth. Uh, with 5% uh, dilution. So what you get is essentially what I call diluted growth because you get exactly the same numbers saying uh, you grow 21% with zero dilution or 26% uh, percent growth uh, with 5% uh, dilution. So just to have a sense. And 30% uh, free cash flow margin after tax. And essentially we get uh, $30. This is a 21% uh, CAGR for 10 years. Diluted growth and 30% free cash flow margin after tax is essentially what the current price is actually implying. Now, as investors, we need to think how reasonable are these expectations for the future, given our real awareness of the company, which 
I'm confident in saying that in this panel is way superior than the average analyst on the street. And uh, we, given that we are aware that we could see a growth trajectory that analysts struggle to express. Now we need to think that analysts, since what they present is essentially an Excel, if uh, they show already an Excel like this, that is uh, hard to justify because you need to explain why you expect a 20% growth, which is very high for 10 years. But what happens if uh, the numbers actually improve from here? That's uh, something that an analyst is, finds hard to justify because uh, analysts are set to think into linear terms. <laughs> but I, I saw once a very nice chart of uh, seeing uh, how the analyst expectations were to uh, compare with the price. And it's like, okay, as the stock goes up, you see analyst expectations rising. Stock goes up, analyst expectation rising more. Stock goes up, up, up. <laughs> the analyst expectation becomes steeper and steeper as the stock goes up. And then the inverse, uh, when the stock starts declining, then analysts expect uh, the, the trend to just to continue. And uh, this makes uh, the life of an analyst incredibly difficult when you have uh, a company that works in tech. So it's not linear where, and uh, at the moment where you have like a real viral growth. So what we could see rather than a steady 21%, let's say we have an acceleration, like these numbers start to really like getting insane if uh, Palantir starts uh, growing uh, let's say 30% once you also include the dilution. Now, this is an optimistic super bull case. To be clear, it's not what I want, would anchor my expectations on. And now we see that uh, we are already at uh, 50 to five, $56 per share. But uh, wait a second, the free cash flow margin right now is at 37%, which is insanely high. Let's say that uh, we keep 37% uh, now. I think that a 37% 37% is a bit dirty because they were not really paying taxes uh, due to the past uh, expenses. But let's say that with scale, uh, the free cash flow margin tends to expand. So once also we include the taxes, we would stay stuck at 37%. Boom, we reach $70 per share. So this exercise, optimistic uh, exercise, tells us if the numbers keep improving every quarter and the uh, analyst could see a future where the numbers are closer toward uh, 25, 30% uh, revenue growth and margins uh, to stay above 35%, the sky is the limit.